on the 28th of October 2021, 300 days after the end of the transitional period, was the last day for companies to file their DUIN, the Downstream User Import Notification, for registration purposes under UK REACH. Today we will see where things stand on UK REACH authorizations. Let's ask someone who knows a lot about authorizations, Julius Waller of EPA. Julius? Julius? Julius, have you been as busy meeting deadlines under UK REACH for authorizations? Oh, whoops. Sorry about that, Chiat. Uh, I was just making myself a cup of tea. Uh, because uh, at the moment there's not much going on uh, regarding authorizations uh, in the UK. That's unless you missed the deadline uh, back in April, uh, when you had to notify you had a pending authorization in Helsinki or, or, or Brussels. Uh, and then the HSE would have given you an additional two years to submit your dossier in the UK. So nothing is happening. No, well, that concludes uh, our... Uh, ho hold on a second, uh, Chiat. Uh, uh, actually, I said there was nothing happening deadline-wise in, in the UK. But uh, the authorization processes and how they are working is much clearer now than it was, uh, I would say, even six, seven months ago. So uh, as far as that's concerned, the UK is not doing so badly. There are, uh, in fact, let me think, uh, I think there are 39 uh, grandfathered uh, authorizations. So authorizations that already uh, were granted in the EU, which have been transposed to the UK without any changes whatsoever. There are uh, 15 uh, transitional uh, authorizations. So those are authorizations which were almost adopted or close to adoption at ECHA or at the Commission. Uh, when Brexit uh, happened, when the, the transitional period for Brexit ended. Uh, and these uh, will be judged uh, directly on the basis of the ECHO opinions. So uh, we don't have to go back uh, and have them readjudged by uh, the HSC. Then there's uh, a further five uh, applications which are a little bit in between. There is a review report. <laughs> the number one review report is Rolls-Royce, uh, who is also the first applicant uh, for authorization in uh, in Europe. So Rolls-Royce remains number one in authorizations, um, uh, perhaps a testimony to their quality of their aero engines. Anyway, uh, there's uh, two others uh, which are really close to adoption, again, based on uh, the um, the data from, uh, from, uh, from ECHA. Uh, and then there is uh, two, uh, what they say, in-flight or new, uh, authorization submitted uh, to the HSC uh, directly, but which fall under the uh, transitional regime. So it's a little bit unclear um, uh, how these will be treated. Uh, it says in the in the UK document, pending completely. So whatever that may mean. In any case, uh, they're working on it and things are uh, progressing. The uh, uh, Like I said, the transitional applications bypass the HSC and go state, uh, straight to the Secretary of State for Environment food and rural affairs for decision, so that's basically ministerial uh, level, uh, where uh, appropriate, by the way, uh, and this is something people are possibly not so well aware of, the uh, responsible minister in Wales and Scotland uh, have to agree or consent uh, to the authorization uh, decision that's being granted. That's because there are devolved uh, responsibilities in the United Kingdom to the, the, the regional governments of Wales uh, and Scotland, which gives them the right to decide in particular on environmental matters. Uh, at least that's my, uh, my understanding. So sometimes uh, you will not only have to get the, uh, the HSC to back you and the Secretary of State, but also the devolved governments um, in case uh, the, uh, the authorization application uh, is relevant uh, uh, for them. So um, the HSC, by the way, uh, is normally, uh, I would say, the ECHA uh, uh, in the process. They will do the scientific assessment part if somebody submits uh, a UK REACH authorization application de novo. Uh, as apparently so has already happened twice. Uh, that's just, uh, it's all quite recent because some of the adoptions, for example, uh, date from, from late August. Uh, so things, things are really running uh, in, in the UK as they should be because there's quite a few uh, authorizations pending. As you know, in, in, in uh, Europe, we had about 100 applications for authorization on the octylphenol, nonylphenol, and uh, I counted uh, only a handful uh, so far as having been resubmitted under the transitional uh, system in the UK, uh, and those are all still to come. 
they have two years to do it, counting from April of this year. So there is still some time uh, to do so. But uh, uh, I think uh, the HSC will be very, very busy. And uh, all the Secretary of State uh, will be very, very busy too. Uh. Apart from that, uh, I think the, the, the one little uh, joke uh, that is shared among people on authorization is that the fee uh, for uh, an application for authorization uh, in the United Kingdom is the same as for the whole of Europe, uh, the European Economic Area, plus Northern Ireland. So you're paying uh, whatever, 50,000 euros, say, per use in, uh, in, in Helsinki, and you would be paying the same for just the Great Britain market. Uh, and no waivers, no uh, fairness, as your other uh, speaker from the, the ministry in the UK said uh, a few months ago on your ChemCon uh, video, uh, as was done for registrations, where he said it was only fair uh, that uh, a UK registrant shouldn't have to pay twice. Well, apparently that logic does not apply to authorization. But there you go. The UK is doing things uh, kind of their way. What about the Brexit cake? Is the UK deviating from EU on authorizations already? Yeah, the, the, the Brexit cake, uh, uh, good question. Um, so the, the reality is that at the moment, uh, what's happening in the UK really is very much based on, uh, on the EU recommendations. Like I said, the transitional authorizations uh, basically take uh, whatever ECHA said as gospel uh, for the Secretary of State uh, uh, to decide. And in terms of the substance recommendations, the scope uh, of the substances is absolutely directly drawn uh, from the European uh, list of recommendations by the Member State Committee in Helsinki on which substances should be added to Annex, uh, Annex 14. But to be fair, uh, the UK uh, has taken some steps uh, which differentiate UK authorization already from, uh, from European ones. Um, many of them are actually uh, but frankly, uh, good ones, in my opinion. Uh, some are practical, like, for example, the latest application dates for substances 44 to 54. I'm not going to name them because they have very complex uh, chemical names. Uh, but they're the latest additions of the EU to uh, the authorization annex. Uh, well, um, those have been pushed a year into the future uh, in the UK in terms of application and sunset date. So uh, you were able to apply for those in the UK until 30th of June. 2022 and, and uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, sunset date is, uh, is 18 months later. Um, the inclusion uh, of new substances, so the UK has uh, reviewed uh, the ninth and tenth uh, recommendation by, uh, by ECHA and this is where it, get, it gets quite interesting. They have only retained uh, DCHP and uh, sodium octaborate to uh, go onto the UK authorization list. And the reasons for not uh, adding the other substances is really quite interesting. Uh, in some cases, it's really quite similar uh, to what's happening uh, in Europe. Remember, these recommendations from ECHA, they are not yet adopted by the Commission, so it's not yet in the European Annex 14. Um, so in this case, uh, the EU is also considering, for example, that uh, tetraethyl lead should not be put on the uh, authorization list because industry has made a voluntary commitment to substitute. And the, uh, uh, the document from the HSC uh, says that explicitly, that that's the grounds why the UK uh, does not recommend uh, its inclusion in, uh, in the UK Annex uh, 14. Um, then there is a TMA, that's uh, another complex uh, uh, substance. Um, there it's quite interesting. They say uh, there's already a different regulation in the United Kingdom which regulates the safety for workers uh, related to the use um, uh, of, the, of, of this substance. Uh, and therefore, authorization doesn't add any value. And that really is a deviation from what would happen in Europe, uh, where that argument, uh, unless there's a European level um, uh, legislation in place that covers both human health and environment, would never be retained. Uh, which I always found a shame. So this is this is rather a good thing. Then uh, also very interesting, uh, the ECHA recommended the inclusion of uh, Mitchell's base and Mitchell's ketone, uh, which are impurities in uh, other substances. Uh, and uh, this we always found very very odd uh, that uh, a substance would be added because of an impurity in the substance rather than as a substance itself and we felt it sort of violated the whole idea of what authorization is about. Well, um, the HSE absolutely follows in that line and said this is not logical 
uh, it's an impurity in a substance. And on top of that, uh, such substances are usually mixed. Uh, and so the level of uh, concentration, which is already very small because it's an impurity, uh, will go down even further. And so they say we see absolutely no point in, uh, uh, in proposing them uh, for, uh, for authorization. Uh, I, I think we, this is an argument that Europe should listen to. Uh, we shouldn't be adding uh, too many substances uh, based on uh, things like impurities, because then things will get really complicated uh, uh, over here. Anyway, so that's, that's rather a good thing. Um, the UK has followed on, on, on a few other uh, substances where they propose to do uh, uh, a UK-based uh, RMOA, uh, that's for the, the infamous DOT and MOAT, uh, as well as the, um, uh, another complicated, uh, what is it, I have to read this out, uh, 1-3-4-thia-diazolidine-2-5-diathone, well, so there you go. So for those, uh, they uh, recommend uh, a UK risk management options analysis. Uh, and in terms of uh, turfenil and uh, the, um, the trio D4, D5, D6, there again, the UK is following Europe again, where uh, the, the idea is that the restriction uh, is possibly uh, uh, more useful uh, than, uh, than an authorization. I think overall, um, these outcomes are not super surprising. The UK always said that they would align closely uh, with the uh, EU on, on, on the substances, and uh, where they might deviate uh, would be environmental uh, pollutants because they have uh, you know, a different environment uh, in, in the island, uh, particularly waterways-wise, than, than we have in continental uh, Europe. But uh, you see that they're not deviating uh, a lot, uh, and they're just taking a different position on certain fundamental questions, such as, uh, you know, are impurities a suitable basis to include something in an authorization? So this is, this is quite, quite interesting, this Brexit cake uh, which is being presented. You seem quite excited about some of these deviations in UK reach. Do you think Northern Ireland, which is still under EU reach, will feel left out? Geert, don't ask me about Northern Ireland. Please, don't ask me about Northern Ireland. Why not? Well, uh, you'd get a frosty response, uh, uh, Geert. Uh, you're right, of course. Northern Ireland is still under the EU uh, uh, reach uh, legislation, still in the internal market. Uh, and therefore, authorizations are EU-based authorizations. But uh, this is completely dependent on this famous Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, which, uh, as you know, uh, the UK negotiator with, uh, with Europe, uh, Mr. David Frost, uh, wants to tear up completely. And uh, what on earth this is going to mean for Northern Ireland-based companies uh, or, or importers and, and exporters or downstream users of, of chemicals, uh, really to me is completely unclear. Um, you, uh, you know, the, the, the UK texts at the moment are completely written in such a way uh, that they apply uh, UK reach to Great Britain uh, and not Northern Ireland. Um, therefore, what happens if the protocol is, uh, is ripped up or, or, or is put on ice? Nobody knows. Uh, is there no more reach uh, in Northern Ireland? What happens to the registrations? Um, what happens to the authorizations that are in place? Uh, on top of that, uh, of course, this question goes way beyond uh, just authorization for, uh, for Northern Ireland. The very use of uh, the ECHA uh, IT systems and so forth, the data structures, was also dependent on the trade agreement between the EU and the UK. So if that is challenged either by EU or UK, uh, then we're going to enter a completely new phase in terms of UK reach, because I don't see how, how things would be working. Uh, everybody in the UK, I think, has made an honest attempt to try and make the system work. Uh, but if the politics uh, start getting involved and the protocol is ripped up, I think all bets are off. So uh, let's, not, let's not go there. Uh, in all fairness, as I said, uh, the HSC and the people in the ministry have worked very hard uh, to make things workable for industry. And to a certain extent, I think they have uh, succeeded at least well enough for us that work on authorization to have a nice cup of tea. Julius, thanks a lot for these interesting insights. Let's drink some tea together at ChemCon Europe 2022 in London, where we will learn a lot more about UK reach and authorizations. <laughs>